morning and welcome to the Cleveland Church of Christ. We're grateful to have you worship with us today. We hope you'll enjoy our worship service. My name is Eric Decker. This is my beautiful wife, Barry, and our little boy, Garrett. Garrett would like to say something right now. I love you. Go Cleveland Browns! Unfortunately, this will be our last service with the Cleveland Church of Christ as we'll be moving to Knoxville, Tennessee next weekend. We've been here, I've been here since uh, 1993, and Barry's been here since 2002. And it's been a great time that we've spent in Cleveland, and we've really enjoyed it, especially being a part of the Cleveland Church. Barry would like to share now. First, I want to share a scripture, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in path of the righteousness of his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In the previous 18 years, the sisters in this church, you love me unconditionally. You are my green pastures, and you nurture me uh, spiritually and help me to grow. Words cannot describe how much I appreciate your friendship and love. I've been here since 1993 for the last 27 years, and uh, I moved here from the Indianapolis Church after I graduated from Purdue to help start the Cleveland Church. At the same time, Vince Moore, along with Dale and Barb Hawkinson, moved here, and we joined. Uh, we were joined by nine other people that moved here from various churches, along with a handful of people that were already in Cleveland worshiping together, but traveling to Detroit uh, to worship with the Detroit Church. So in 1993, we started the Cleveland Church of Christ, and it's been a great 27 years. I've spent about half that time in the singles ministry, uh, working with the singles and campus and so on. And I really believe that God has a special place in his heart for singles who follow him and keep themselves pure uh, while being single. Jesus was single, so I think that uh, the singles are definitely, definitely have a great place in God's heart. It's been awesome to be a part of the marriage ministry, having such a wonderful wife. Uh, it's, it, having a, a Proverbs 31 wife makes marriage an awesome experience. And that's what I have. And we want to thank all of you for helping us to have a great marriage. We want to thank all of you for helping us to be uh, parents, be great parents. And uh, we still have a lot to learn. And you've helped us so much. We really appreciate the 100 plus uh, best friends forever that we have in the Cleveland Church of Christ. And we appreciate that all the ways you've helped us to grow as disciples of Jesus. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 1 it says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear, and much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So always encouraged me to know that I don't have to know very much to be a, a man of God. All I have to know is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm -hmm. And as I remember that, I remember how much God loves me, how much grace God has given me, and that allows me to take my focus off myself Focus on loving God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loving others. And as you, if you, as you think about us after we move, please remember Jesus and remember Jesus and Him crucified, and how much God loves you. And please uh, resolve to follow Him with all your heart. At this time, we're going to say a prayer. So please bow your heads. Dear God, we love you. We thank you so much for the great blessings you've given us and the time that we've had in the Cleveland Church. Thank you so much for loving us, and we pray that uh, you'll really be encouraged by the uh, worship we have today, the worship that we give you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Cleveland Church. This is Ryan Painter, and uh, coming to you with another message from our Beneath the Surface series. So I've been going outdoors quite a bit, and today I'm actually in my backwoods. Um, a number of the neighborhood kids have been coming out here during quarantine. Let me kind of show you around here. Look what they built. So we have this little stream over here. They built this uh, bridge, which is pretty cool. They have built a stairway to get down to the water, which is pretty awesome. Dug out a little fire pit here. 
some type of TP situation going on here. Anyway, I thought I would come out here today to uh, preach the word. So uh, welcome everybody. Let me take a seat and we'll get right to it. Well, I've taken my seat here and we're good to go. Like I said, my name is Ryan Painter and we're going to continue our sermon series on Beneath the Surface. We've been looking at the Gospel of Matthew and taking it more and looking at it from more of a Jewish lens than a typical kind of westernized Christian lens and drawing all kinds of conclusions and finding all kinds of goodness in there. And so you might be thinking, now wait a second, Ryan, with all the racial tensions going on and all the social injustice out there, why are we going back to Matthew? Why are we doing this again? And I'm here to tell you that actually this is the perfect book to be looking at during a time like this. The Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of social justice. If you can remember back, Matthew is the tax collector. He is the unwanted person of the Jewish society. And he is writing to those that are kind of oppressors, if you will. He's talking to the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders and saying, look, no, 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 Jesus is the way. And there's a place at the table for everyone in my father's house. He starts off his genealogy and he puts people in there that have really have no business being in there. You have Rahab and Tamar and Bathsheba. These, some of these women, they, they were not what you would typically think think of as like these superstars of Christianity and yet, or I'm sorry, of, uh, of Judaism and yet Matthew's like, that's the point. Jesus comes from a people that are not, that don't have it all together. Uh, in Matthew 4, I, I've mentioned this a number of times, the crowds that are coming to Jesus, it's all of the unwanted people. It's those that are oppressed, it's those that are sick, it's those that are hurting, it's those that the Roman Empire said, get out of here, we don't want you here. Jesus says, come with me. The Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn. There's a lot of mourning going on right now. Blessed are the meek, meek meaning like you're in an oppressed state. There's nothing you can do. There's a lot of feeling of, of meekness that is going on right now. And so Matthew, in many senses, it's the gospel of social justice. And so we're gonna continue our sermon series. We're gonna to get to the latter half of Matthew chapter six. And we actually are going to talk about social justice, not so much from uh, um, not so much talking about the racial tensions and all that sort of stuff, but we are going to look at another oppressed people that have been around since forever, and they're they, and they're oppressed not necessarily because of the color of their skin, but by their lack of opportunity and the la lack of resources that they have. We're going to be talking today about the poor, the needy, and the hungry which is always a group that is, is, is oppressed. And so let's dive on in and let's, uh, let's hit it up here in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we have these three paragraphs here in Matthew chapter 6 that we just covered. In fact, if you, if you haven't already, grab your Bible. I want you to do that. And I want you to turn open to Matthew chapter 6 so that you know what I'm saying here. So hit pause. Boop. Boop. Okay, we're back. So if we look here, I just read three paragraphs. And it's, it's always interested to me, like, what these paragraphs kind of have nothing to do with each other. They look like a little bit of a sandwich here. So he starts off in verse 19, and he's talking about money, right? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So there's this, this, uh, this calling for us not to care about the material world and, and greed and storing of things up, right? And then he goes into this kind of odd one of the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eyes are good, your whole body will be good. Like, okay, that seems cool. And then he goes right back and he starts talking about money again. No one can serve two masters. Either you will love the, uh, you'll hate the one and love the other. You can't serve both God and money, God and mammon. And so we have teachings on money. We've got this eye is the lamp of the body and then more teachings on money. And what we're gonna look at here today as we look beneath the surface is we're gonna see actually all three of these are gonna blend together masterfully. 
And uh, the title of today's lesson is simply this, the good eye and the bad eye. The good eye and the bad eye. All right, so how are we gonna break this down? So in the, in the Jewish context, this idea of having a good eye and a bad eye actually did have to do with money. So I want you to do something. As you're in Matthew 6, and I know that you are, I want you to look down at the footnotes. And specifically, look down at the footnotes from verse uh, 22 and 23. And in verse 22, my little footnote says this, the Greek for healthy here implies generous. And the next one says, the Greek for unhealthy here implies stingy. Well, isn't that interesting? Like, what do these things have to do with each other? What do eyes and generosity and stinginess, and really what we're dealing with, dealing with is we're dealing with some idioms. Now, what's an idiom? An idiom, we've got tons of them in the English language. You know, there's all kinds of things. Half the time, we don't even know where they come from. But what are some ideas of idioms? Well, you can talk about, you know, um, you, you, you can talk about a dime a dozen, uh, which means, of course, they're, they're cheap. You can get as many as you want for a dime. Uh, you can talk about different idioms like, uh, how about this? Uh, uh, you can pull someone's leg, catch my drift. You know, you got a million of these different things. Now imagine trying to explain to someone from a different country what it means to pull someone's leg. All right, so you're trying to explain to them that, that pulling their leg actually has nothing to do with a leg or pulling. You know, they're like, I don't, I don't get it here. What are, what are you talking about? Pulling a leg is, is, is about kind of making a joke, like teasing a little bit. It really doesn't seem to have anything to do with a leg or pulling of a leg. I got to look that one up. I don't know where that one came from, but, but you kind of get the idea. Well, in, in, in the Middle East here, this idea of having a good eye and a bad eye, it's kind of like an idiom. And everyone knew back then that having the good eye was having a generous eye. And having a, uh, if you're stingy and whatnot, that was the, the result of having a bad eye. There's a time in the Gospels where, where Jesus says, uh, after these people had come in from working and a few hadn't worked very, very uh, long at all and yet they got a full day's wage and people were upset that they were getting a full day's wage and he says, and he says something, you go to the Greek, you'll see it, he says, why are you so upset that I have a good eye? And he's saying, why are you so upset that I'm generous? And so in the context here, when we look at these three paragraphs, they actually fit together like a glove. Don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but rather be generous. Give it away. Don't store up in barns. And then he closes with this idea of where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so we can have a good eye or we can have a bad eye. And so, uh, so let's dive into this just a little bit more. I've been reading this great book and it's called uh, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. I'll put it up right there. Okay. Um, and there's, uh, there's so many great chapters in this thing, but they, uh, one of the chapters, they talk a lot about money. And they talk about just the difference between the Westerner and how he views money versus many, many, the majority of other cultures and how they view money. And you see, the, the, the big difference is the Westerner feels as though there's this unlimited amount of money to go around. Like there's this spring and it just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. And therefore, those who have money are the ones that took the ne necessary steps to acquire that money. They got themselves a great education of some sort, they, or they got themselves a, a certain skill set that, that, that others don't have. And through hard work and, and really you know, working their craft and, and, and putting in the long hours, they've been able to give themselves kind of a, a way into that spring of money. And so the more and more comes in and, and there you go. And we can actually, as Westerners, almost, if we're not careful, look down on those who don't have money, like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, why didn't you go educate yourself? Are you not working hard enough? Because again, we feel like there's this endless spring that's coming and everybody can have theirs. They just got to work hard to get it. Now, the mindset of someone from uh, like an Eastern mindset, it isn't remotely like that. There's no money spring anywhere where money's just flowing out. Rather, they view money and wealth as though there's almost like this much, right? There's a certain cap and there's this much and we need to make this much go around for everyone in the community. And so if somebody gets a disproportionate amount, they get, you know, they, they got this much and everybody else only has this much, kind of get the idea here, that, that that would be like the most selfish thing ever, right? Like if I have, 
If I have, the more that I have means the more that you don't have. And so if I have and you don't have, well, wow, selfish of me, I need to be generous and I need to give. The American goes, I got mine and you can have yours and he and she can have hers. Let's all go get rich together. Again, that's the difference in the mindset. And so Jesus is addressing this heart. It's this heart that says, I've done well for myself. I've followed all of those wonderful Proverbs that talk about acquiring wealth and working hard and all of those virtues that are, that are sound and biblical. But as a result of that, I've got my peace, but I'm not gonna share my peace because I've worked hard, I've deserved this, and God is saying no. Jesus is like, no, that's not how we're gonna treat this thing. You, if you have, you need to be generous and you need to give. And so we see all these stories of generosity all throughout the scriptures. Um, again, in this book, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, they, they share a story about the, about the difference of these cultures. And there's a missionary that's come over from, from overseas and he's actually, it's kind of like a reverse mission trip. He's come to the United States and he's come to speak and he's, you know, in town for like six months. And so he's staying with another minister and that minister's, you know, he's, he's pretty well to do. He's got like two, two cars and he's got his family and whatnot. And so the visiting minister, I think it's from the Philippines, comes in and, you know, gets the necessary licenses he needs and he, he just takes the second car. And he drives around to different churches and preaches and does his thing for six months. And the American minister's like, Man, this is kind of weird. Like that guy never asked. He never said thank you. He's never shown any gratitude. And so at the end of the trip, he asked him and he said, so like, why did you do that? Like, how come you're so ungrateful? Why didn't you say thank you for what I've done for you? And, and the Filipino minister is like, oh, well, wait a second. In the scriptures, it says that we need to give that those are in need to those that are in need. I'm here in your country. I have nothing. I have no cars, you have two cars. I just assumed it was natural that you would give it to me. And, and you kind of see the difference in the cultures. The, our culture is this is mine, I, I have it, it, it's all about me, and, and you can, I'll give, but boy, you better give me the proper appreciation and recognition for that. The other culture says there is no mine, there is no me, there's none of that. Really, well, we're all in this together and you have an extra one laying, laying around here, of course I should be able to use it. So again, we kind of see the difference here and Jesus is attacking the stingy one, the one who is storing away in barns, the one who is, is keeping more and more for himself and isn't giving to that community, isn't giving to the other people, isn't giving to the oppressed in his community. Why? Because it's his and Jesus does not like that heart one bit. All right, had to relocate. The sun was getting in my eyes, so here we go, better spot. I remember uh, learning this lesson when I was in Toledo, and uh, you know, we had a small church there. We had a little bit of a benevolence thing for people that were in need. And we had this one brother who was, um, he was from Africa, and he was over and, and just, he was a hardworking guy. So I worked at the hospital, he worked at another kind of local retail place, and he was a full-time student at the University of Toledo. And occasionally, you know, he would just run out of money, and so we would help him out. Uh, not all that often, but whenever we could, we would help him out. Sometimes it was, you know, pers you know, people were personally helping him out. Other times the church would, would offer him help. But he was a beloved brother, and we just wanted to help him. And then I remember coming to find out one time that he was regularly sending money and wiring it back to Africa. And I got a little upset. Like, we, wait a second here. We're giving you our money to be able to help you out, and you're just kind of passing it down the line here. And, and it... And he informed me of some things and he goes, well, yeah, that's how it works, right? And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. We're trying to help you. Like, we can't help the, everybody in Africa. We want to help you. And he said, well, there is no difference between helping me and helping my family back in Africa. We're all in this together. And he was actually paying his brother's uh, education bills. His younger brother was in high school or middle school and was paying his education bills. And But he's like, Ryan, there's no, there's no... I don't have money, there's no money. It's all in the same pot together. We are all part of the same family. And that kind of helped me to understand, oh, wait a second, other people view their wealth very differently. In America, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. Uh, it's very common actually for married couples to have their own separate checking accounts. 
Just think about that for a second. That's how individualistic we are. That even a married couple who God says is one, they're saying, no, 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 I've got my paycheck money and you got your paycheck money. And you know, amen, I'm, if you wanna do it that way, fine. But it, it's just to show there's a real difference in how we view wealth. And so we've gotta make sure that in our independence of storing things up, that we don't become guilty of this, storing away in our, in our barns while letting everybody else suffer and, and hurt. Jesus' call for us is to be generous with our wealth, generous with our assets, and not stingy. And when I think about the word stingy, you know, you can, some people call it stingy, other people put a nice spin on it and call it frugal. And, and those are, you know, <laughs> when, I'm, when I feel like I'm being frugal, I feel like I'm doing something good, like, ah, I'm not wasting my money. But that can also be called stingy, and so which is it? And I, I think the difference between the two, here's the difference between the two. Someone who's frugal says, I'm not going to buy product A at that price because it's too expensive. But I'm going to be frugal with my money, I'm gonna save my money so that when I can get product B, I'm actually gonna pr provide product B for that person over here, or that person over there. In other words, frugal or generous is, I'm going to be, you know, kind of tight with my money. I'm not just gonna throw it away. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be smart with my money, but I'm not gonna be smart with my money for me. I'm gonna be smart with my money so that I can help other people. The, the stingy person says, well, no, I'm not gonna buy product A. Product A is too much. I'm gonna wait for product B, and that's the one I really want, and I'm gonna wait for the sale, and I'm gonna buy it for me. And so you think you're being like frugal and it's some kind of like biblical thing, but no, you're not. You're actually just being stingy because your end goal is to buy it for yourself. And that's the difference. God says, don't be stingy and don't like, you, you, you don't just keep trying to acquire things for yourself at the greatest price and all that. Our lives need to be about giving to others, giving to others, giving to others. And all the teens are looking at their parents right now going, yep, come on, gimme, gimme, gimme. No, that's not exactly what I had in mind. Um, okay, let's have a little fun here. So here's what we're gonna do. I want everybody to extend your arms out and I want you to make a triangle, okay? So I want you to make a triangle and then I want you to take the triangle and I want you to look at some, at some other object in the room, uh, preferably the further away the better, okay? And I want you to hold it up and I want you to look through that triangle with both eyes and it might be a little bit blurry but kind of focus, all right? Now what I want you to do is I want you to close your left eye and keep your right eye open. And if the object within that triangle did not move with your left eye closed, that means that you are right eye dominant. Now again, doing the same thing, if you close your right eye and you see it move, yeah, see the picture moves, I'm looking at this tree and all of a sudden it jumps over there. Uh, that means again, I'm right eye dominant, all right? so. You can tell which of your two eyes is dominant. When they come together, one's really grabbing it. And I think in the same way, I just have a question for you. Which eye is dominant in your, in, in your life? Is it the good eye, the generous eye, the eye that looks out and says, oh my goodness, I wanna help. Oh my goodness, let me just take care of this need and that need and let me help this person and that person. Is that the eye, is that your most dominant eye or is it your other eye? The eye that says, ooh, this would be good for me and let me save up for, for my storehouses and my barns and all, and all these sort of things. Which of your eyes is your dominant eye? Your generous eye or your stingy eye? Well, in the spirit of being generous and helping oppressed people, uh, specifically in this sermon, oppressed people that are, that are poor, that are hungry, that are in need and want, I actually began to look up some statistics and honestly, with everything going on right now, everything's heavy, everything's challenging. And I, I looked at maybe two or three statistics and I'm like, this is enough. Like I can't handle any more um, uh, of this emotion. But I'm gonna give you a little bit here though. In our world today, those that are living in extreme poverty, extreme poverty means they're living on less than $2 a day. Roughly 10%, a little less than 10% of our world is living in what we would call extreme poverty. You and I probably don't know too much about what poverty is. We most certainly don't know what extreme poverty is. And in extreme poverty, that's roughly 750 million people are living in these types of conditions. There's uh, another 750 million people in our world today that, are, uh, that do not have access to clean water. 
the statistics on the amount of children that are dying from preventable disease and starvation, it's, it's just, it's honestly, it's so much. It's so hard to, to, to be able to fathom that. Um, I actually started looking at some statistics, some statistics about uh, our city, uh, the city of Cleveland. And uh, there were some things about Cleveland that I did not realize. In the, in the city of Cleveland, out of all the major metropolitan cities, uh, I think that's defined by populations of 250,000 or more. Anyway, Cleveland has the largest percentage of kids living in poverty than any other city in the United States. Over 50% of the children living in the city of Cleveland are, on, are, 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 are living in poverty in some way, shape, or form. And again, as I, uh, I know it's heavy, and, and, uh, but, but I, just, I just want to appeal to your generous eye. That's our backyard. Like, those are our people. Uh, as I was looking at this, and there's other statistics about Cleveland and poverty, you can look them up yourself, but I kind of got a little pit in my stomach, like, now wait a second, like the world's problems, like anybody in the world can take care of those, but man, city in Cleveland, like, I don't want to be number one on that list. I kind of got a little indignant, I hope you do too. Uh, and, I, and I think about like our, our, our line here that uh, when we, we, we put this thing up, our, our leaders have been getting together on Thursday nights and talking about different things. And we've come up with this little line that we want to really represent our church. And it's transforming Cleveland one soul at a time. And we mean that on a number of levels that obviously we want to baptize people and we do that by studying the Bible with them. And that's not done in some huge thing, in some huge context. That's We love to sit down with people individually, look at the scriptures, look at the plan of salvation, look at repentance, help somebody come to that decision of being baptized into Christ. And that's an awesome thing. But really transforming Cleveland one soul at a time, like obviously baptizing people is an incredible thing, but there's more to Christianity than just that. And it does make me think, man, how can we help? How can we make a difference? And I don't have all of those answers, but I really want to appeal to our generous eyes. And I, I think about the parable where it says that, that, that we're given these talents, right? And, and they're harvested and, and God is gonna come back one day and he's, and he's gonna say, what did you do? And I just think, man, if, if God were to come back today and say, Ryan, I left you here. I put you in the city of Cleveland to minister to the city of Cleveland. And I gave you these talents and I gave you, the, you know, these sort of things. How did you harvest them? How did you take care of the city of Cleveland? I, don't, I, I mean, I'd definitely say, listen, I shared my faith a whole bunch and tried to baptize people, but how much more to the other issues are, have, have we done? It just makes me think, wow, it actually is very overwhelming to think about trying to solve all the world's problems and all those sort of things. But, but amen. I, again, th th this morning, I just want to appeal to your generous eye, that generous eye that says, man, there's people in our backyards that don't have. What can we do to help? Let me ask you a question. Why aren't you generous? Why am I not generous? Why are we not generous? And, and again, there's definitely generosity. Actually, I think our church does very well in terms of uh, giving and helping and meeting needs. But this is generosity is one of those things where you can always take it up the next notch. And my question is, why haven't you taken it up the next notch? And I'll tell you for me why I haven't taken it up the next notch. It's because I have got my, you know, I've got my little barn over here and I'm storing up and the American culture is very different than the Eastern culture. You know, in the Eastern culture, when you get old and you can't take care of yourself anymore, they're going to bring you on into the house. They're going to take care of you. And, uh, you know, your expenses are going to be relatively minimal. There weren't health care expenses back then. It was just, your, you know, what you're going to eat and whatnot. But the family would take care of you. Well, in today's day and age, that's not what we do in America. You know, we send you over there to that particular facility and they're going to take care of you and all those sort of things. And those costs do get very, very high. Um, and and can, uh, can lead to all kinds of things, lead to financial ruin. And so the American says, well, I do need to store up in, in these barns because one day no one's gonna be there to take care of me. And that's very real. I'm not saying we need to cash out our 401ks and all that. Like the context that we're in, it kind of makes sense that we need to store away some in the barns because we don't want to leave this massive financial burden on our children and all that sort of thing. So I, you know, I get it. But I think that what it comes down to is the reason that I'm not more generous and probably the reason that you're not more generous is that you're worried that if you give away most of what you have, there's not going to be anything left for you on the other side. And did you notice the, the word that I used? The word I used was worry. 
our worry keeps us from being generous. And it's in that context, you're going to see the flow here of Jesus' sermon, that we continue to pick it up here and continue to read in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor, they do not spin, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I want to take you back to verse 25, and I want you to look at that first word, therefore. Therefore. You know, you don't start a sermon with the word therefore. You don't start a paper, you don't start anything with the word therefore. Therefore means that there is a point that has been made, and here's the conclusion to that point. And in Matthew chapter 6, all of these teachings, they fit together. That when we're not generous, when we're not giving, when we're thinking more about money and storing away and all of these sort of things, that leads us to, we do that because we worry. And he says, therefore, do not worry about these things because God is going to take care of them. You know, what causes more stress in a marriage than money? It's a horrible feeling to be running out of money or, you know, bouncing a check like, oh, you know, worrying about this and worrying about that and it causes all kinds of fights in marriage. It's, it, it, it's challenging. And I think the reality is, is the older that you get and the more responsibilities that you have, the more that worry piles up. Because now it's not just me that's going to suffer from whatever poor decision I made, but it's my wife, it's my children, it's, and we get all kinds of stressed out as a result of that. Money causes stress. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to both, this is really tough, you ready? I want you to be generous and I don't want you to worry. Whew. Those two things do not go hand in hand because when I'm generous, then I have less. And when I have less, now I begin to get worried. You see how this all comes together. And, and he, really what he does here, he takes us back in many senses to Genesis 1. And he says, I want you to look at a couple things here. Again, Jesus is, is out, uh, he's on a hillside, the birds are all around, right? The flowers are all around, and, and he just uses some prop examples, and he's like, you know, I've probably got some birds flying around me, by, probably hear them in the background there. He just says, you see those birds? You know, those birds have been around for billions of years, okay? Uh, maybe if you're a creationist, thousands of years, whatever it is that you believe about Genesis 1. Those birds have figured out a way to survive as long as since day one, they're still here. And you look at these flowers of the field. I don't really have any flowers around me at this particular point. But anyway, um, you look at these flowers of the field. They've been around for billions of years or thousands of years, depending on your take. Um, but he's saying, li listen, like these things, I, I take care of those. Like I take care of the birds. And so if I'm going to take care of the birds, then don't you think I'm going to take care of you? Remember back in Genesis 1 when I said, hey, those birds, those, the, those birds that I created, those were good. And those flowers that I created, those were good. But don't you remember day six when I created man? I said, these are, this is very good. And so if I'm going to take care of the good, then I'm going to take care of what I value as very good. And so really what it comes down to when it comes to our financial, our financials is, it just comes back to Genesis 1. Do we believe that God thinks that we're very good? Is God going to take care of us? It really all comes back to that. I want to give a shout out to my friends, the Taylors, uh, Shed and Jessica. And many of you know, Shed uh, uh, took a new job right at the beginning of the year uh, with a startup. And his timing, honestly, it just couldn't have been worse. It seemed like a great decision at the time, but uh, due to COVID and everything, he was immediately let go. Um, no severance know nothing. 
And wouldn't you know that Shed and Jessica made the faithful decision that they were gonna continue to give to the church regardless. I didn't tell them to do that. They just said, we're, we're just gonna do it and we're gonna trust God. And so as you can imagine, you know, their finances are decreasing and whatnot as, as Shed's been off work. And they wanted to send their daughter to the summer camp. I just got this text, honestly, right before it began the sermon. And uh, I wanna say the, the summer camp cost like $1,000 for Addison and they just didn't have it. It just wasn't there. And then out of nowhere, they got some check from the city, um, and I don't know exactly what all, all the details of it, but it more or less covered virtually all of the expenses for Addison to be able to go to camp. And it just, that's what God is getting at here. He's saying, don't worry about money. And I, I know that's tough, and I know there's caveats and all that, but he's just saying simply go through your life and trust me, if I can take care of a flower, if I can take care of a meaningless bird up there, I most certainly can take care of you. So I want to take us back and, and look at verse 25. And there's like two ways that you could kind of interpret verse 25 in, in terms of tone. You ever do that where you read somebody's text and you're like, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Is that, are they upset with me? You can kind of do that with the scriptures from time to time. And, you know, I think a lot of times we read verse 25 like this. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry. Don't you be faithless. So ye of little faith, I take care of everything else. I'm going to take care of you. You better not worry. And we take it like it's this command, like this, uh-oh. It just seems like another one of these impossible commands by this very demanding father that we serve. Like, ah, how can I do this? It's just too much. I'm supposed to be generous. And now I'm not supposed to worry. And it just, it, it, it seems almost harsh. But I, wanted, I, w I want you to take, take you back, and, and I'm going to talk to the dads here for a second. Do you remember the first time you went swimming with, yeah, maybe your, your toddler, two, three years old, and you're in the swimming pool, right? And you're, you're sitting there, and you're in the pool, and, and, and your child is kind of at the edge, and, and, they, and you're saying, come on, jump, jump on in, and you're right there to grab them. And, and they're worried, and they're kind of looking like, do I do this, do I not? Now, some kids just jump right in, you know, every kid's got their own disposition, but you know, maybe they're a little bit tough. And, and in that instance, you would say, don't worry, little Johnny. Don't worry, little Timmy. Don't worry, daddy's right here. I will catch you. And you're saying in a way, not that you're commanding the child and you're looking down on the child. You're actually providing those words as a form of comfort. Please trust me. Please jump. Daddy's going to catch you. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to verse 25. And let's read it again from, the, from, from, from a father who's saying, man, I know this is hard, but put your trust in me. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. I got gotcha. you. And, and it is with that that the scripture becomes encouraging and actually kind of makes me want to jump into those arms. Like, oh, this is going to be tough, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that leap. And I think for us, it's that leap of saying, I am going to live a generous life. I am going to give back to my community. I am going to give back to people in the church, my neighbors, whoever's hurting, my family members, whatever. I am going to do that. And even though it might hurt a little bit, I'm going to trust that my dad's right there and he's going to catch me. You see that difference? We got to be looking at our God like that loving father who's saying, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Not as the this father who's looking down commanding us to do it otherwise we're in big trouble with him let's make sure we're uh we're really uh trusting our awesome father in heaven after our sermon we've been making our little phone calls and we get in our little discussion groups within our small groups and uh and each week we have a discussion question and and the discussion question this week is real simple which is your dominant eye is it the one that, to that, that is your dominant eye the one that's stingy and greedy and and storing up for yourselves all these treasures on earth or is your dominant eye the generous eye, the one that just wants to give back and to help the people in need? Again, the scripture says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Guys, when we give, when we're generous, just feels good, doesn't it? Just makes you full of light. It's like the scripture coming to, coming to life here. Again, as we, all I'm asking us to do today is just to consider. What would it be like if we were to be more generous? What is a faithful way to be generous and, you know, still kind of keep the 401k? I don't want us to run out and do something, you know, crazy without getting input or anything like that. You understand what I'm saying. But how can we be more generous? 
maybe for some of you that, uh, that are still employed, that haven't missed a paycheck, that got those fat stimulus checks, maybe you can do something that you haven't normally done before. And again, I'm not talking about church stuff here. I'm not talking about contribution. Huh? Maybe you can use it to help someone in need, someone in your family, in your community, with the greater city at large, with the world at large. But I just want us to think more like Jesus. To be like Jesus is to be generous. To be, like, to be generous means to view this world through that generous eye, the one that sees those that are hurting and wants to take care of them. I want to thank you again for joining the Cleveland Church. It's been a, a, a great day out here. I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Amen. Not so fast. So I got home from recording this sermon, and wouldn't you know it, I got an email from Hope Worldwide with this uh, video about all the work that's been done and all the money that's been donated. And I thought, you know what, this would be a perfect cap to what we were just talking about. So uh, without further ado, let's go to the video. I'm Reese Nealon, Interim Chief Evangelist for Hope Worldwide. As the pandemic spread around the globe, Hope Worldwide opened a COVID-19 relief fund and immediately began providing help with needed food and medical supplies. We then reached out to our supporters around the world, asking for donations to increase our impact. In 1 John 3:18, the Apostle John says, don't love with words, but with actions and in truth. And you have done just that. Together, we've now raised over $2 million for this effort. So far, God has enabled us to give support to 239 church partners in 60 countries, helping to feed over 35,000 people. Your sacrifice and belief in our mission has made a significant difference for our brothers and sisters in need. Your gifts are helping to provide food for those going hungry, personal protective equipment and medicine. And in the near future, we will also provide needed emotional support for those affected by the pandemic. Hope Worldwide is putting together a team of trained mental health professionals to assist people through these traumatic events. Muchas gracias. Estamos aquí recibiendo este, este, esta despensa y queremos agradecerle a todos los hermanos de la iglesia. They were able to have food, they were able to have water, clean water. I have received your great support, which is very helpful for me in this pandemic situation. Thank you, all my brothers, sisters, and friends. Now, a simple matter of two points. We are forced to be on unpaid leave to pay the notice. So I think I thank God for hope worldwide for their help with my children. We believe that in times of crisis, no one should feel alone, and Hope Worldwide is proud of you, our church partners and donors. But the work is not yet done. The challenges continue, and we want to make sure that no one in our global family goes to bed hungry tonight. Pray for these needs to be met, and if you're able to give, please go to hopewworg forward slash COVID-19 and donate now. Thank you again for your generous support. God bless.